you're probably wondering why I have this slide up here as my first slide. I wasn't quite aware how long ago this was, um, but it was a really important day for me. I grew up in a, uh, I went to a convent school in the Bronx. I got into Hunter College when it was still an all women's college. I had no experience in the arts except for sitting in the library and drawing a Hummel statue in a, by, by the books. But when I graduated from high school, I got into a summer stock company and there were three of us who were apprentices and all and every week there would be another play and it was all, with all professional actors. And one of the three of us was going to get, um, uh, to belong to equity in order to go forward as an actress. So when, so neither me or my girlfriend from high school, Bernadette, uh, we didn't get that, uh, but Bernie went on with the director to help him out in New York, and I came down one day in 1965 to this building, which at that point was the Whitney Museum of Art, and it had a major Ivan Albright show here. And I knew I was going to go to the Café Go Gogo afterwards because Bernadette, with that director, was um, managing an evening that was a tribute to Charlie Parker, and Thelonious Monk was going to be there to play the piano. So here's the Café Gogo in 1965, and here is the front of this building when it was the Whitney Museum. And this was one of the days that changed my life. And um, so I'm going to go forward from there. I mean, it, and there'll be, uh, whenever anybody gives a talk, they could, they could structure it in any different way. I mean, like everybody's lives have so many different ways to approach them in terms of telling a story. But one of the things I realized after all these years is that I do have these threads that keep coming back and forth in and out of my life that are in addition to my painting, going in my studio and painting. So, in 1968, I had a studio on Worcester Street, and of course it didn't look like this. This building was very run down at that point, but this is a current shot because they're actually advertising a rental there at this point. And it, it's just up on the same side of the street from where the drawing center is now. So there was my studio, and on the map, um, I lived at 74 Grand Street. And of course it was a time when there were not that many artists downtown. And um, we all knew each other, we went to each other's things. And this was my then next studio, which was in 1970 down on John Street. So at that time, we, because we all were each other's audience, I had seen a performance uh, at the Anderson Theater on Second Avenue of The Mind is a Muscle, and also with Steve Paxton and Yvonne and everybody doing these performances with mattresses and um, just different media. And I, by accident, met her in the Grand Union supermarket and she, um, I told her how much I loved that performance, and she asked me to be in her workshop. She said, do you want to be in the workshop? So it turned out that three artists entered her workshop. It was Joe Bear, myself, and Rosemary Castoro, who at the time was married to Carl Andre. So right away, we went into uh, learning. We were, we were learning The Mind is a Muscle. We performed it at Lincoln Center. And we started rehearsing uh, for a Broadway event that she was doing that was called Rose Fractions, and it was at the Billy Rose Theater. So I'm the person on the left with the long hair, and it was all the people from Grand Union. It was David Gordon, it was Doug, it was Becky Arnold, it was everybody. And that's Judy Paddell, that's David Gordon, uh, that's Doug Douglas with, the, with where you see his kind of beautiful hair. 
And this was a, a multimedia performance, and it was, what was it, 68 or something. And um, that was, again, a kind of moment that defined me, because it, it was, I was just so excited to be learning from her and be part of this. Uh, at the same time, this is now 19, also 68, Joan Jonas lived across the street. I mean, we all just knew each other, and people needed bodies, and they needed, and, but I, I had also studied modern dance in college, along with painting and art history. So um, at that point, Joan was in a relationship with Peter Campus. And Peter Campus and Joan decided to do a collaboration together. And this is 1968. And this is her first performance video called Wind. And we filmed this out in, the, you know, out in Long Island in the freezing cold. And I, my memory was her idea, because everybody would just talk about things all the time. It was so exciting. So you know, she was talking about the moment when uh, when the person in, Karen, you might remember, uh, the movie uh, about penicillin set in the Second World War, the black market, and at the very end, he walk, she walks past, huh? The third man, thank you, walks past the camera. So Joan's entire idea of this, or that we were gonna crab-like be crawling down the, this empty beach in the freezing cold and a blizzard, and we were gonna all go past this camera, and it was a real camera. So this is wind. And then at the same time, I was painting. And Susan Caldwell opened her gallery on West Broadway. And at the time, there were not that many galleries in New York who showed painting. Susan was one of the main galleries that showed painting. So I'm going to go through. I'll, I'll tell a little bit of talk story. Um, this is my first. Big show, the gallery was 5,000 square feet. And Susan didn't plan that far ahead. I mean, she would come into the, my studio maybe once a year and say, oh, look, at you have all this work. Do you want to have a show like in three months? And I'd say, OK. And so I mean, it just kind of happened like that. And of course, way back then, the dealer paid for everything and took 33 and a third percent. So, so they took, they had, a, they took photos, they did trucking, they did everything. And this was my first show, and the painting that is that painting straight over there is called Henning. It's six by 12 feet. Um, I, ha I had, the reason I was working in all, in this scale was I was thinking about the, the edge of when something was still human scale and didn't move over into architectural scale. And everything in those paintings was hand drawn. It was the just how my arm could make an arc. I I couldn't go further than that, right? Um, so I so in some funny way, this one is a 18 foot wide painting, that big one on the right side. And I was using all these scumbled layers of color to try to make color that was non-determinable when you first looked at it. So it, it wasn't that it was straight out color from anything. It was thin layer on top of thin layer, which was pretty crazy for an abstract painter. Usually all the scumbling and glazing was done for a representational painter, not an abstract painter. But the, it kind of made a time and a space in the painting that was not like hard edge geometric painting. So this is a early 70s. This is this, is this whole show. Also, um, I, I was trying to draw at the same time as paint. So the painting on the left, I had made all my own pastels that were enormous globs of pastel that could fit in my hand so that I could wet the canvas and I could use the pastel on the Roplex so that it set into the medium as it dried. So that it, again, it had a feeling of painterliness, which was different, and it was all, we all made our own paints. So it was, you know, it was dry pigment, it was a medium. So that's, so the kind of chroma 
that intensity in these paintings was not from a normal paint source. This is a painting called uh, For Byron's Flatbed Truck Ride, and it's about eight feet by 16 feet wide. And one of the things I, I always did simultaneous to painting was I, I was trying to catch up on being culturally impoverished. And, um, and because it was just it was so exciting. So at one point, somebody said, oh, it was like Joe Christmas standing there. And I said, what's that? And the person said, oh, it's from Light and August of, of William Faulkner. So I started to read all of Faulkner. I was on a, I couldn't slow down, but I had a job out at Kingsborough Community College. It was one of my early teaching jobs, and the train line took so long to get out there, and the rhythm of the train was so insistent that I actually could slow down to read Faulkner. So that, I mean, there are funny things that are accidental in my life that have kind of helped me out that are kind of timely. These are all oils on paper. Um, this was in my first show. The first, they were $80, I remember that, because Michael Goldberg bought one. And I, you know, and we just knew Michael Goldberg because he lived on the Bowery and you know, he, he cooked at food and we'd run into each other. And he came into my show and it was like such an honor that he bought one of these oils on paper. So um, then I got, in the early 70s, a job teaching at Bennington. And this painting is also, again, like a 12 or more wide, foot wide painting. And it's in a show of faculty. It was an overview of faculty from maybe 10 years that had taught at Bennington and the, to the Tony Carrows in front. Um, and so there were lots of things that I thought about, I, that I, I went on pilgrimages to look at art. It, it just was so exciting to me. Uh, I went on a pilgrimage to Italy to look at all of Piero della Francesca and Giotto, and then I went to look at tableaus or multi-panel paintings that told stories. I always kind of thought, like, like what, could an abstract painting be something additional to being an abstract painting? So I remember looking at the triumphal procession of Caesar in England, and first of all being surprised that it moved from right to left, and like it started, the story started on the right, and I, kept, and I was teaching at that point at Princeton, and, I, and they had a lot of Chinese screens in the museum, and I was looking at how sometimes the story or the where the imagery crossed the edge. And I was thinking about Cezanne's bathers and other Cezanne paintings and thinking about how an edge could be the end of a shape or like if you went across it or if you drew with different media that the lines would stay in different spaces. So something that maybe superficially looked like a hard edge abstract painting was very slowed down by all of these other ingredients being in different spaces. It was creating shifting spaces. And I would plot those out. And, and I very much also kind of thought about that because I loved Italian primitive painting and all the different perspectives within it. So these are multi-panels. They're usually six feet wide, each of them. So that's, some are, th are 18 feet wide, some of the paintings are uh, 18 plus six. Um, I started drawing and folding paper, trying, to, I did lots of works on paper. This one is 18, I guess it's more than 18 feet wide. That's a four part, that's 24 feet wide, that painting. And so that's from a show in 1978. And I, so I just wanted to kind of give you this background of kind of me going into the studio, kind of thinking about things, thinking how can I move them forward. 
Um, how do I not make the same painting over and over again? And at one point, which was 1980, I was reading most of Mishima's novels, and I was studying um, kabuki dance. I was actually studying kabuki dance. Um, I was recently divorced. I tried to figure out who I was after being married for 14 years. And one of the things that I realized was I hadn't really done anything physical for most of those years. And so I went back to studying Tai Chi and uh, Kabuki dance with a Kabuki master who was teaching at NYU. And I had gone to see the, the first Kabuki show by myself, I don't know how I got there, in New York, I think it was in the 60s. And and it just really made an impression on me. And I even made wooden shoes to, as Gaeta for performance people to wear because I was doing perf a perf big performance that I choreographed at um, Hunter and I also taught a whole dance workshop in Richmond, Virginia and did a performance with dance students there in the 60s and early 70s. So I kind of in and out did these other things while I was mostly painting. And in reading the Mishima, I thought, well, I needed to kind of re-enter my paintings. And I started to think about the characters in his, his series that was called The Decay of the Angel. And I thought, well, maybe I could assign different forms, roles, and and somehow, and somehow use them just privately, not to tell a real story, but to tell enough of a story for me to be more inventive from painting to painting. And also, I started to include different materials. So that big painting there, which is called Hakoryo, it has paper mache on it, it has plaster rags on it, um, the ones on the right side have dimensional chicken wire that's covered in plaster and cheesecloth and painted. Um, so they got more, more and more dimensional. On the big, the big scale ones, uh, that's called Decay of the Angel, that one. Um, when you stand in front of it, you can kind of feel a draw, like a physical, it's obviously larger than you are, but it still has that odd feeling of a physical scale in terms of how things are moving and kind of pushing against each other. So they started to get more and more physical, so much so that I started to do reliefs out of mahogany and pine, which I'm not showing you. And in 1982, I went to Japan for the first time and I, when I came back, having seen many, many things, um, I, it also reminded me of the Chinese screen paintings and Japanese paintings in the museums. And I thought of how I could change the perspective from panel to panel. And all my life, been, and you know we started like 50 something years ago, uh, I've tried to make a black and white painting. I am incapable of making a black and white painting. But this was, this was one of the attempts of me trying to make a black and white painting. So this is like six or seven feet by 18 feet wide. But, and also a, a kind of idea of restraint came in. So now I'm, I'm, going to, I, I'm, I'm leaving some white spaces between things that happen. Uh, that, that just kind of came up. So somebody saw a, a big painting of mine in Louisville and said, I think we should ask her to do a national choreographer's project with the choreographer Lynn Taylor Corbett and the musician Charles Strauss. And Charles Strauss had done Bye Bye Birdie and Annie and all these things. So we met in my studio and brainstormed and came up with a full length ballet and it opened the Louisville Center for the Performing Arts. So this was called Tunes. It had 19 dancers, which is one of the reasons I made 
an eight foot cutaway so that that enormous sculpture, which is over 30 feet tall, wouldn't interfere so much with them moving in space. Lights were thrown through it. Um, things, different curtains were pulled out as, as the storyline advanced. Um, there were whole male sections of just men dancing. It was really wonderful and exciting. And at the end, there was even a trapeze um, that brought one of the lead dancers out. Um, so it, it really moved through solos of duets and only male dancers, only female dancers. It started out actually with a grand piano on stage and two other musicians, and then went to the full orchestra down below. Um, so that was really exciting for me. And because I had done all of those constructions and dimensional reliefs, it kind of helped me out. And I'm not sure how I met this guy, Franco Colavecchia. He was a, a friend. He had gone to art school in England, and he was a friend of David Hockney's. And he was designing a new Carmen for the New York City Opera. And he had a studio in Soho, and he invited me to look at how they were doing everything. And then he was open to me hiring one of his people. Uh, and so for a week, we set up tables in my studio, and this guy taught me how to draft and built a model for me so that I could physically understand. I mean, I certainly didn't want to. This was the size of the New York State Theater. So I mean, I certainly didn't want to fail miserably in a space the size of the New York State Theater that was opening the whole Louisville Performing Arts Center. So that was really interesting to me, to do that, to work on that. Then that led to, two years later, uh, another combo where it was the same choreographer, it was me, and it was uh, Sean, Alan Sean, who is an atonal minimalist composer from the Sean family. And we met together, and this is for Atlanta, and invented a ballet, also for a whole, the whole corps de ballet of the Atlanta Ballet, and it was called Escape. And that big sculptural form in the middle, uh, I, I helped make this out in Jersey City in a big fabrication shop, and a male dancer comes through it, and it moves on magnets into dis different positions. Um, so. It w and it was a three-act ballet, and it had very beautiful, different kinds of lighting and music. And then this was a piece with Jennifer Muller in an 88 at uh, the Joyce Theater, which was, of course, a smaller theater. Um, so, and then sometimes these things were redone, so I would get to go to the Pacific Northwest uh, you know, company and some other places where they would redo these ballets. So I, I, at, one, at this point, 99, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just hitting on things where ideas kind of change how I'm thinking. And I realized I had never worked on a vertical painting. It was always landscape oriented. Um, and I, so I kind of thought, well, what would I do? I mean, how does, a, how does, how does it affect you when you stand in front of a vertical painting? You know, it makes you rise, like if you're standing in front of El Greco <laughs> and you're looking up and you're being drawn up to the sky and the clouds and God. And so I did, I just made all these big paintings. Also, I have to say, I have a perverse streak that if somebody does it occasionally, you know, uh, like at one point somebody from a gallery came to my studio and said, oh, Francis, these are too difficult. You know, we have a video camera, and this was a famous gallery. We have a video camera, and we see how long people spend in front of paintings. And these paintings take too long to, <laughs> to look at. So he says, you know, you're, you're damned if you do. So of course, my natural inclination is, oh, you don't like that? 
I'll make it bigger. <laughs> I'll do it bigger. You know, I like fuck you. So, um, so I made all these tall paintings, and um, I mean, I didn't really show them anywhere. But then I got the opportunity to show all these tall paintings in Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and uh, and it was all on the ground floor. They're all eight foot tall and less than four feet wide. And they're made with different materials, including even sumi ink. And, um, and they have really different f feelings of the spaces. And lots of the space feels atmospheric. And also, I, I think I was thinking also about the shifts between grand scale and a kind of close up of a moment. So I have a lot of these vertical paintings. Um, that's one of the only places they were, they were shown. And there was a second story on that Moravian College site where I got to put all these smaller paintings. So it had a lot of paintings, and it was really kind of wonderful for me to see all these there. So then I, before this one, I'm, I'm there. I, I don't know why, one day I'm looking at the wall and I thought, you know, how, t how tall and how wide could something be where a line would still function as a line and a shape and a panorama? I don't know why. <laughs> so I started taping the wall and I started out making some paintings that were eight inches tall and five feet wide, 10 inches tall and 10 feet wide, 10 inches tall and 20 feet wide. <laughs> so I kind of went doing this and looking at it and thinking about it. This is a painting that is maybe 16 inches by, I don't know, maybe 10 feet wide. And every line is cut from another stencil. Um, to try to just get a feeling that's different from a painted line, right? So the, all those red lines don't feel like painted lines. Uh, you know, the, that changes how you feel about the painting and what you're looking at and how you look left to right, you know, and sort of back to how do you look left to right, how do you do a processional painting? And so I, I painted lots of paintings that usually were 13 feet wide. And also, I was trying to use chemical colors to make a natural light. <clears throat> so that was kind of another odd ambition. Um, it's like, well, could I possibly do this? Could it feel like a particular time of day or twilight or anything? Um, then, before this, there was a moment in 1991 when I had been asked to be on the board of Triangle Artist Workshop. But in order to be on the board, I had to go to the workshop and be an artist in the workshop. And I had never done anything like that before, and I've never done anything like that since. So because I, I, I don't know, I was just shy. I didn't really know how to deal with it. So I would get up at like 5 o'clock in the morning. And I would go over and I'd paint, and everybody would be partying all night, and then they'd paint all day, and they'd stay up really late, and I'd go to bed early. But, um, but one, there were always these wonderful talks in this living room just up in Pine Plains, New York. And at one point, Michael Freed gave a talk about a book he was working on at that point about Manet, and how Manet was out of sync with his contemporaries and was radical in relation to his contemporaries. Now, I hadn't thought of that before. And I'd always, uh, like, a, like a movie that was always really important to me was The Conformist. And, you know, where the guy just wants to be normal, right? And of course, that's a heavy film. But it's like you want to be like everybody else. And, um, and Michael, and I mean, I knew that my work was eccentric. And, 
Michael Fried came and, I mean, but I never thought that Monet's work was eccentric. So it was interesting to hear Michael Fried talking about Monet. And then he came to the studios, and, I, and he came early and I was there, and we were talking. And after that, so it was 1991, I thought, okay, like, so I'm eccentric. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's just gonna be that. And um, it also, I mean, I've always been eccentric and kind of given myself carte blanche. My dealer used to say, Francis, well, you changed again. What did you do? I could just sell your work, and now it's different. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> so unfortunately, she decided not to be a dealer anymore. But <laughs> because, you know, she valued, there were cert thir certain things she valued where she would deal with it. And, um, and Virginia Cuppage was in that gallery at the same time, who's sitting here. And so, you know, I, I, that we used to fight about whether you were Delacroix or Ang, whether you could have drawing or painting, you know, that it couldn't be in the same place. And I wanted it all. So that with that, after I got back from Japan and I showed you that painting that was mostly white or pale colors, there, there I really intentionally tried to put more drawing in the paintings and have ever since. I've, Drawings have been a really important part. But one of the other things I realized in, I, I don't know, I heard a talk somewhere about like how you compartmentalize your brain. And I had had all these different experiences that I always kept separate. So when I was in college, I actually studied geology. And all of a sudden, I thought, well, you know, how do I refresh my being able to paint these paintings? I seem to need to tell myself stories. So, but I could tell myself geological stories. So I could use mapping, I could use symbols, I could use, I could tell stories. I could even tell creation stories. I could, you know, in the same place. So that opened up a lot for me. And, I'm just going to go through these paintings, and I mean, you can. There are they're they're, you know, shifting planes. There are things that that used to be underwater, and then they dry out, and they crack, and they're gone. And you know, uh, this painting is. I, then I started doing all these big, wide paintings. So this is like four something feet by eight feet wide, and. Um, and these ones, some of them are named after blues musicians and, uh, and a tribute to George Harrison. Also, I'm not sure when I got a yellow Fender Stratocaster guitar, but I decided I really wanted to play slide guitar. So every Saturday I went to Bayonne, New Jersey, and I studied with this guy who was terrific. So I became more aware of music and thinking about things, and he would tell me stories about every piece of music. Like when I was studying Norwegian wood, he talked about you know how George Harrison had gone to India and then came back, and because of his love of the sitar, he decided to capo the guitar at the third fret, which changed the sound for Norwegian for Norwegian wood. So I mean, it's like all these great stories, right? And so. There's light, there's plateaus, there's, this is a funny little nod to, what is it, a Saarinen table with that? Okay, that's my, I mean, I actually am pretty funny. So some, so some things are me talking to myself and thinking about, well, the hell, I'm sticking a Saarinen table base in there that's gonna hold up the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a, an eight foot wide one. The one for George Harrison, I can't show because it was all whites, all different delicate tones of white. And I, I just can't photo, I can't shoot it. It never comes out. This is about maybe 13 feet wide. And I've always been interested, what happens, right? If Looking at the painting, you have to move your head. What are you seeing? Are you renegotiating the space? 
are you having to like think? I mean, I, I, lo I love thinking about sublime painting and the moment when in Caspar David Friedrich, the monk comes to the edge of the cliff and has to look up and you know, or even in Hudson School painting where they're looking down. But I, I think about, well, what if I have to keep <laughs> moving myself, even though this looks so simple? But in order to see these things, I have to keep moving myself in this imaginary position. So for 35 years, my husband said to me, Francis, why do you never put people in your paintings? And I say, because you're outside the painting. You know, you, and then, and you, have come to this moment where you have to think about, are you gonna enter this painting? Are you moving through this painting? What's really going on here? They're, they're obviously not local colors, right? I mean, artists used to talk, 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 talk about local color chemical color, you know, Johannes Itten, the Bauhaus, all the color theories. You know, how exciting it was to think about all those things. I still think about all those things. That's what gets me up. Okay, so, now, beside my husband going, Francis, there's no people in your paintings, I, I have, through all these decades, written poetry, kind of had monologues, um, but never really knew what to do with them. I don't know why I started this. It was after the World Trade Center had come down. And I said to my brother, who is a really good writer, and after I performed with Yvonne Rayner, he performed with her and was in all her early films and Babette Mangold films, and also danced with Lucinda Childs. And James is a really good writer. And I said, like most of you probably know, the exquisite corpse, where somebody draws, you fold it, somebody draws, you fold it, and then it's really quite amazing when you open it up. So I said to my brother, James, write me one page of script, and I will deal with it. In terms of, I had this idea of a two-day commute. So my brother writes this one page that's a disaster. And I thought, wow, he's getting back at me, like, because I'm the older sister, for like our whole life. It's one page. It starts out with the noise of the helicopters after the World Trade Center has just come down. And the female character, it's a two-person script, the female character has to put a mother in a nursing home. That's the opening page. So I said, you know, that's really perverse. Why did you do that? He said, hey, you're in a car. You can talk about anything. And that was actually really an amazing opening for me because it was true. If you're in a car, you can talk about anything. So it became this pretty deep conversation between the husband who picks her up and their old hippies. And he plays air guitar. And it's funny. And it's, you know, it's got edge. It's edgy. And I hand drew all of these frames of bad vernacular architecture up and down the Hudson River from, from Jersey City up to North Bergen, New Jersey. So I hired a professional person to record, you know, record us in the script. Here's the the explanation of it. Uh, I, I drew everything. But my idea for the script was that it was a radio play, even though I was drawing all these things. And after a year and a half of my editing all these stills to this whole soundtrack with road noise and inside car noise and the male and female voices and music, uh, I, I, I saw it was not working. It was a bad idea. It wasn't functioning as a radio play kind of idea. So I partially rewrote the script, had somebody else come, and re-recorded the whole thing in a more naturalistic way, and then re-edited all the video and audio to, to make that work. So there are a lot of, and just to make it 
probably even harder, because I didn't like the look of drawing in the computer. I have a very old, I guess it's brass, dip in ink pen <laughs> that I use to draw every still on animation paper over a light table with three sprockets. So it opens up with a book opening and, and a monologue. And then these are some of the views from the passenger side. And it wound up being about nine and a half minutes. So they're all ink drawings that, are, that I brought into Final Cut Pro and edited them as a video. Then, back to working. And I had a big show in 2010 at Sundram Tagore Gallery. So I'm thinking about, you know, again, similar things, but I'm using also pastel and charcoal, and I'm sealing it in different places so that you're getting different feelings, and because of the charcoal, and I'll say a light touch, it sits way back in a different space than something else. Uh, I'm aware of, you know, axonometric drawing that is in the paintings. Uh, I'm thinking about a model of something, like how different cultures represent reality. I think about that stuff. I think about, oh, could I use a, well, could I use that yellow? <laughs> it's like, I remember there was one moment when I thought, man, I really want to use purples and blues like in this weird painting. And like, how could I do that? Like, like what would be appropriate? Like, would it, does it ever fit in there? Or how could I use that intensity yellow and it still actually lays it down like a plane and makes you feel like you can go back in space? Um, colored pencils, ink, um, they're all, and, and so I moved to panels because the panels can take all these different materials. So, so sometimes there are correlations between the kinds of shifts of a fault, a geological fault, to perhaps what it might look like a long time afterwards. So there's a different senses of time for me in the paintings. I, I was thinking also about how there was a funny moment when um, there was a report in the New York Times that was connected to auto insurance that people were getting in more accidents because they couldn't judge distance, because they watched too much television. And so they, they weren't looking at reality enough anymore. And so, I mean, I was thinking about that, and it seemed, it seemed well, it seemed actually quite plausible. But beside that, it seemed kind of funny. And I started to think about if we could only see nature in television screens. So occasionally, like, there are these weird monitors that show up that have aspects of nature in them. We're almost at the end, don't worry. I, I've, I'm, I've left off whole decades. I mean, I, I obviously love color. I can't stay away from it. <laughs> I try to make, use color that doesn't work. So this is from my 2010 show, which was my last show in New York. And at least you can get a better sense of the scale 
of some of the paintings to each other. And this is a show in Los Angeles from 2011, which has different paintings in it. Um, it had a back room of smaller paintings, and you can see the, the textures better in here. Also, um, they're, they're really, I mean, I, I kind of keep working on a surface until it gets a certain feeling to it. So, and if I need to, so that I don't look like I'm following an outline over something I've painted already, I'll cut a stencil so that a new layer can go over it in a, in a easier manner that breathes better, it, that doesn't look like you're just avoiding the edge of something. So they look, so pe some, some, sometimes people have said, oh, you just get it like that, and I and it's no, I don't get it like that. I sand it down, I go over it, I go over it, I sand it down to make it look like it, I just got it. <laughs> so, but no, it's very painful and <laughs> and laborious. So then I thought. You know how you try to keep somebody involved in, the, in what they're looking at, like me. I'm trying to, like, how, how do I involve myself, in, but how do I distance myself at the same time in some odd way? Um, I did these prints that were three by four feet. I had them printed. They cost a lot of money. And I looked at them. There were five of them. And I started cutting them up. And I thought, oh, I'm going to introduce some digital moments in these paintings. And after cutting up the first one and part of the second one, I thought, wow, you are so stupid. Why would you spend all this money <laughs> to, for a three by four foot print to cut it up instead of going and buying some good paper and printing parts of it yourself that you could then cut up and put in? So, I have three, three of these big prints left, but what they did, oh, this is different. Okay, but they, they, I will get to that. So we, we had a move, and we wound up being homeless for five months, just moving with like two sawhorses and a blow-up bed and a piece of plywood and from monthly rentals that had no furniture in them. And, but before that, we had rented some funny little place in the north end of Lake George for like a week or two. It was very run down, but it felt to me very magical there. And it started me thinking about a story. So in 2009, I started to write a script about a nine-year-old boy. And I started drawing all of these uh, storyboard. So that's like, Oh, it's, some, I don't know, four or five feet wide, uh, holding up all these pieces of paper. I started to, to give myself a storyboard that I was looking at and I was writing the script. And then for a while, quite a while I had half the story, I didn't know where I wanted to go with it. And, uh, but I started to draw and animate the sections. So again, this is hand drawn, and it starts out with all these pieces on the ground that there's music, and the pieces start moving and they build the house. And lines start coming in and form a lake. And at some point, all the lines go down a hole, and the hole changes shape and becomes a bird, and the bird flies away. And the boy, who's this nine-year-old boy, sees these things happening. He's, he's alone. He doesn't have a mother. His father's never there. This is, I paid for a video, for a video of the galaxy. That's, that's how it opens up. And um, so it, it became a very, uh, an elaborate story that I had to keep learning more and more things in order to work on it. Uh, 
I've, uh, I've done all my own video and audio editing, and all my own drawing and everything. So I have to kind of keep taking classes to learn to do things. And, and make things happen behind other things for the story. And, um, and my husband is an actor and a director. And he had directed five solo performances of a wonderful, funny uh, actress who had performed these things at Don't Tell Mama. And she was in uh, John Jesserin's East Side series called Chang and Avoid Moon. And that was the first time that Steve Buscemi ever acted. He was a fireman. And her name was Valerie Charles, and they were a couple for a while. And they sometimes would perform together. And I always loved these solo performances of Valerie. And I tried to get somebody else to do something with them. And they were like in the late 80s, early 90s, something like that. And finally, I thought I could use a, she told me, she gave me all her tapes. They were terrible VHS tapes. At one point, I tried to copy, like try to do frame after frame. I couldn't see because the VHS was so bad. So then I thought, I edited part of her, one of her things, which was called Duan Does Hollywood. It was a whole performance. And, um, and I decided that she was going to be under the water and the boy was going to meet her. And uh, so he goes down. I'll, I will show you just the trailer for it. So that's the poster, and here's the people who are involved. So Ron is my husband. He's in SAG, so I had to make this an official SAG film. He does the voiceover. Valerie is the performance artist whose, um, whose video I've partially rotoscoped and turned into a moving line drawing. Uh, David is the boy's voice. And it just won the best short animation at the New York Short Film Festival. So that was a complete surprise to me. And it, and it also, in the same week, got into to this wonderful film festival in Nova Scotia. So I went up there for that. So that, it, I mean, uh, you can see how long, how many years I kind of worked on and off of that. So it was like 2009 to 2016. <laughs> That's a long time. So, but I wasn't always working. You know, I'd think about it, I'd come back to it. I'd, and uh, so now, we're going to try to do this. Tab. Wow. OK. And I'm going to play you just the trailer. Johnny was all tangled in his colors. He woke up and knew he had forgotten something really important. He looked around his room for any clues. Nothing. He went downstairs without even changing into his clothes. Suddenly, all the water in the lake was sucked down a hole. At least that's what he first thought, since he'd taken a few baths and knew what happened when he pulled the plug. But then he noticed that the water was also taking on a shape as it went down the opening. Bricks lined the hole. It was dark looking down and a long way to the ground. Johnny then saw the rungs and began ah. climbing down. Hello? Okay, you're a freak. And then, this is really exciting. There's no issue. Let's escape from that and go here and go down. Okay, so the so 
I mean, obviously now I can use people. Oh, but you never see the boy. The, everything is from his eyesight and his distance. And the only thing you see, it's nine, nine minutes, 12 seconds, the whole thing. And it's actually quite funny. And you only see his hands from his eyesight distance going down. So I'm really quite relieved that I finally finished with that. Uh, so in the midst of that, I, um, I had started to do these digital prints that then I made into these big panels. And they're about four by five feet. So there were five of them. And they start out with this. And that gave me the idea to start putting in pieces in all the rest of my paintings of digital moments where I would cut out a section and I would sand down and I would insert it in and you know have weights on it that would make it dry. But also what this did was it made me think about, so the, here's some of these paintings. And I'll just talk story as I show you some of these paintings. And, and they have these digital pieces in them along with you know, all the other stuff. And it made me think of the, at a certain point I, I thought back to those and I thought, what about a book? Like, could I make a book and try to get my brother to write? So I made this whole, I used my credit card points and I got a big scanner and printer and I printed out like this size. And then after I'd done one copy of all these, I thought, nobody wants a book this size. I mean, you turn the page one time, it's all wrinkled. Who wants, this is crazy. So it kind of went from one iteration to another. So these are three by four feet. These are all paintings on panel that are gessoed. They're all wooden panels. They're gessoed. They have these little pieces of digital printing in them. And so I started to think about, well, then my brother gave me, which I, I guess I hadn't realized. He and his first wife had done a page for the first issue of Art Spiegelman's Raw magazine. And when I went up to the Jewish Museum to see the Spiegelman show, there was the first issue. And I had found a copy. I thought it was the real one, you know, because whenever they inked the boards, they were quite large size, uh, in my mother's effects. And I took it to my brother to get framed, and he said, why would you frame that? It's a reproduction. I'll give you the original one. And, and, and Andy had two issues of the first edition of Raw Magazine. So he gave me this beautiful collaboration between him and his first wife that's in Raw Magazine. And it started me thinking, well, these are big paintings. So it was easy to make very wide paintings with the canvas, but not with boards. They're just too heavy. And so these are usually 13 feet wide, and they're made, these ones are made of three panels, but some are made with four panels. So these are all from 2014, there's, and there's more, so that's going on. And at the same time, I, and I mean, I'm looking at traveling through these places, and I was thinking about I just, I, you know, I was thinking about the book, and I was thinking about James's panel, and I started. Here's a, a view of the of the west wall of my studio, and these are four part ones, and this was the painting that was on this announcement. So. The last couple of years, along with painting, I started to make a story. And I had them, I wound up with 32 panels that were 16 by 20 inches. And I had them printed on vinyl. And there are six characters. And I really like them. And uh, so I think I have a studio shot in here. So here. There are 
22 panels, if, if you look from left to right, there's 22 panels that have a story of Ginger and Billy, which is a kind of cinematic story of this, these two people meeting each other. There's two characters called Hiker One and Hiker Two, and they act as a Greek chorus, and they comment on those two characters and their action. And then at the end, there's uh, male and female, which are kind of like a Freudian coda that act in a sort of funny way of male and female. And on the left at the bottom, I built this shelf that's about maybe 30 feet wide. And there, 10 of her dreams. So after seeing that, I, I went through different iterations of a book. And I've wound up with a graphic novel that I'm waiting for the second set of proofs on. So these are all these vinyl panels. They're on, they're panels on gessoed board, gessoed wooden panels. So I've actually made a whole book and I've worked with a graphic designer who, because I don't know InDesign, I've, I did it all in Photoshop and other things, and he put it in InDesign for me to go to the printer. So we saw the first set of proofs, and then I realized I needed to add a couple of pages. So I've added an afterward. So if you're reading, right, do you, you can kind of get a little sense reading that, something of what's going on. So it, it's called Ginger Smith and Billy G. And it's sort of a little obviously ironic and optimistic and utopian tale. Um, and here are the six characters. And it's in two acts and an afterward, and then her dreams are interspersed in the different acts. And this is the cover. <laughs> and it'll actually, uh, if these proofs are good, then it's just gonna go up for sale on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And I have another project, which is all of her dreams. It's a year and a half of dreams. So I might publish that. And, uh, and this is where I work on, see that's on the left with the little lamp? That's, that's as simple as it gets. That's the animation light box. It's that simple. I think maybe the sprockets that are plastic cost three bucks. It's just that simple. There's a bunch of computers in there. And so that's, that's where I work on all that other stuff. And this is a painting that I've just finished. And there's a ton of stuff on my website if you're interested. So in where it says archive, there's a whole section that says downtown artists. In the late 60s, I wanted to be the Fred McDara of the artists of the 60s. Fred McDara had done a book of the artists of the 50s. So every time an artist would come to our loft, I had a dark room and I would take their photo. So I have the only, I, I haven't found the negatives, but I've only found all the pictures I had printed in my dark room. So we had scanned those in and there are all these photos there which are really very nice of all these people that live downtown that were New York artists. And there's all these other kind of pieces in here. And this is Season's Greetings. And that's, that's it. <laughs>